Uh, that's a pretty bold uh, statement, Dr. Tour. How's it been going since then? Well, nobody came out with any answers to it. None. Zero, zero. Nothing. Nobody had any answers. And I knew nobody had any answers. Greetings to the brightest audience in the country. This is Real Science Radio. I'm Fred Williams. And I'm Doug McBurney, Bible student, science geek, amateur comedian. It's good to be with you again, Fred, talking about real science on Friday. So recently, a very high-profile roundtable event occurred in the confines of Harvard University regarding the origin of life, and we're going to talk about that on today's show. If you recall, Doug, last year we had a two-part series with professional chemist Dr. Royal Truman, and he walked us through the overwhelming pitfalls of the secular attempts to solve this question about the origins of life. On today's show, joining us will be another great chemist, and one of the most effective and well-known advocates for the God of creation. And he's really he's quite prolific for debunking atheists on their origin of life, frankly, nonsense. This guest has millions of views on YouTube. He has over 130,000 subscribers and is a professor at one of the top engineering schools in the country. A good friend of mine is a graduate from there. But first, Doug, we have to do our interesting fact of the week. Are you ready? I'm always ready for an interesting fact, Fred. All right. from you. Well, what is the largest internal organ in the human body? Uh, Well, you know, Fred, I, I think I know this, and I think it was recently updated as a matter of fact. So if I'm not mistaken, it's the interstitia. (laughs) <laughs> sorry doug it's the liver oh i think you're incorrect in fact i'll do a little oh. research i'm talking recently okay. updated within the last so the interstitia technically it's always been considered dead space between organs but there's been some recent okay. yeah the recent research says that no the interstitia oh. itself is an organ and it's the largest organ in the body even larger than the skin so we're now we've got a controversy what a way to start how yeah. appropriate since we have james tour on <laughs> <laughs> yeah so let's welcome our guest to the show dr james tour from rice university so uh dr tour it's a great honor to have you on real science radio thank you so much Dr. Tour, welcome back. And folks, if you haven't seen Dr. Tour on YouTube, then you're one of the few. He is a synthetic organic chemist who received his bachelor in chemistry from Syracuse, his PhD in synthetic organic and organometallic chemistry from Purdue, and postdoctoral training in synthetic organic chemistry at the University of Wisconsin and Stanford. Professor Tour has almost 800 research publications, over 130 granted patents with another 100 pending just for good measure, and he has other awards and achievements too numerous to mention in a half-hour radio broadcast. And as mentioned earlier, Dr. Tour not only does he have the strong presence on YouTube, but he offers a private Zoom call with anyone who is not a believer in Jesus Christ but would like to hear how he became a man of faith with Jesus, which I think is awesome. Actually, let me let me clarify that. It is to those who do not believe in the physical resurrection of Jesus who want to hear why I embrace that. It's very specific. It's not to, so much gotcha. to hear my testimony. It's to hear about the resurrection, and it is only for those who do not already believe. Gotcha. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. That's Well, I really appreciate you doing that. So... And I did want to mention, too, before we get into the show, Dr. Tour was named Scientist of the Year by R&D a Magazine back in 2013, and he was named among the 50 most influential scientists in the world today by the bestschools.org in 2014. And again, I mentioned earlier, Rice University is a very prestigious engineering school. I have a dear friend who graduated from there, so... Anyways, Dr. Tour, it's great to have you on the show to talk about the origin of life. But before we get to that, do you know which is the largest organ in the human body? I'm kind of catching you off guard, but, you know, Doug, my co-host, kind of threw me for a loop there. I was going to say the skin, but when you said internal organ, I was going to say the liver. I didn't know what what Doug was talking about, but uh, I'm sure he's right. Okay. 
Well, just so you know, gentlemen, that there, there's been a published paper, but there is some controversy within the internal medicine community about whether or not this is actually an organ. Because of my creationist tendencies, I tend to suspect that even though to us it looks like empty space in between organs, that it's probably not. It's probably more sophisticated than it looks. And, and so I'm with the side that says it looks like an organ in and of itself. I'm a bit biased. Okay. Well, I'm going to give you that one, Doug. <laughs> if you actually look at it, tech, if you look at it technically, empty space is what we mostly are because it's the space between the electrons, protons, and neutrons. So actually, actually, the the the, the entire Earth could fit into a football field, football stadium, if you were to get rid of all the empty space. So it's mostly empty space. <laughs> and, so, and so what are the odds there are, there's something about all that empty space that we might not fully comprehend? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. There's, there's, uh, there's a, there's a lot about that. It's called dark matter, and uh, it's, it's presumed that there may be seventy to ninety percent of all of space, uh, all of matter is dark matter that we cannot see or detect. And uh, one day we'll be able to, to detect it, but we, we, we can't right now. So there's definitely something unidentified, whether it's dark matter or I don't know exactly what it is, but. We want to talk today about the Origin of Life Challenge, which was why we, we originally uh, tried to get a hold of you back in October, I believe, when the challenge was about to expire. But so much has occurred since then that uh, we're glad to get a hold of you now to talk about it. It's very exciting. And let me play that uh, clip really quick from YouTube. It's a YouTube short. I am going to take down all the content on my YouTube channel where I've critiqued Origin of Life on one condition. The condition is this. I am going to name 10 key researchers that have published key papers in the area of Origin of Life. And I'm going to give all 10 of you a chance to answer five essential questions that need to be answered for Origin of Life to be solved. What are these five questions? Well, they're the same five questions that I put up on a recent debate that some YouTubers have said have already been solved. Show me the prebiotic chemistry that would do this coupling. This scheme is what James wanted me to write on the board. If their answer is good, take their answer. I'd like to see you, as a researcher in the Origin of Life community, take their answer and present that as a solution. All five have to be answered to have a model for the Origin of Life. You just answer one, and I'll take down all my content. Uh, that's a pretty bold uh, statement, Dr. Tour. How's it been going since then? Well, nobody came out with any answers to it. None. Zero, zero. Nothing. Nobody had any answers, and I knew nobody had any answers. You think that I'm going to put up something that has an answer, but it just goes to show that, <laughs> number one, the things that YouTubers say are all solved. None of them are solved. The very papers that they cited did not solve it, and that's why the authors of those papers could not use their own work to solve it. Nobody knows how to make any of the polymeric structures, whether it be the poly peptides, the polynucleotides, or the polysaccharides. These are the three polymeric classes of compounds that construct us. Nobody knows how those could be made given the amino acids, given the, the, the sugars, the saccharides, and given the, given the nucleotides. We don't even know how to make those basic things in, in chiral pure form, but even if given those, nobody knows how to make those in any origin of life fashion. Nobody can do those couplings. So, so we're really clueless. And as, and as far as the, well, let, me, let me finish here. As far as the information problem, there, there's no answer. And as far as the cell construction, everybody's lost. So it was very easy for me to challenge this because the whole area of origin of life research is a bunch of nonsense in the sense that it's not solving any of the problems. We don't know. We just don't know. And these five basic questions, these were five of 5,000 that I could have put up there and, and uh, uh, they couldn't be solved, but go ahead. So what now, are you saying that you actually asked the authors of the articles that Professor Dave waved around so emphatically, you asked those actual people about those actual papers? Yes, these are the actual people. These are the people that they, he's been citing. 
<laughs> beautiful. Wow. Just beautiful. <laughs> but because I, and I, I listened to that debate. I didn't watch it. I had headphones on. I was doing some yard work and I listened to it and it was obvious to me that you became frustrated with uh, with Professor Dave. And so I just wanted to give you a visual of how awesome that debate was with Professor Dave. So I'm, I'm doing my yard work. I'm listening to the debate. And at several points during the debate, all I can hear is... <laughs> and so I, I realized that Dr. Tour's at the chalkboard. Yeah, I mean, this, this is the way chemistry is done. Because the chalkboard does not lie. Hmm. It exposes everything. As soon as you have to go to a blackboard and write the, the equations of what would happen, you're stuck. These guys can talk all day. They're garb. They're utter nonsense. And this is why, for example, Steve Benner, his reply to me about this is, oh, if, I, if you had given me the challenge that you gave to Dave Farina, I wouldn't have even needed slides. I could have explained how life originated within an hour. And then I said, okay, Steve, how about, how about you uh, come to Harvard and we'll talk about that? He said he wouldn't come. I mean, who in this field doesn't, doesn't accept an invitation to go to Harvard? Everybody does. I mean, when you're invited to go to Harvard, you go to Harvard and speak. All 10 of those people no, all nine out of the 10 of the people refused to go to Harvard and talk about this. And then I said, Steve, since you already know, I'll go down, fly down to your institute and you can tell me. And uh, uh, it's hard to get to his institute. And uh, it, it's in Florida, but you got to fly into Gainesville, which is a real pain. And then you got to drive a couple hours to get to his institute. And I said, you can explain it to me. You can have everyone in your institute explain it to me. And I'll sit there for three hours. I won't say a word unless I don't understand something. And he refused to have me there. So this is a bunch of nonsense. These guys don't know. As soon as you got to go to a blackboard, it calls out all the all the deceivers because you got to write it up there. You can't just wave your hands. All right, show me the chemistry that's got to take place. And that's why I did it on the blackboard. And he refused, Farina refused to go to the blackboard. He says, I, I don't need the blackboard. And he put up the title of a paper. Well, why not go to the blackboard? And then when he said, uh, uh, this is what Jim Tour wanted me to show, Afterward, he said this. That's not what I wanted him to show. That doesn't solve it. None of the schemes in those papers solved it. If the p schemes in those papers could solve it, wouldn't you think the authors of those very papers would use those schemes? Because they don't solve it. None of those were solvable. All of those are, are insoluble, ins unsolvable, and insoluble questions when it comes to science. And so the, the Blackboard calls it out. Yeah. And, you know, Dr. Truman walked through a lot of the chemistry problems with origin of life. And I asked him if he, him and his colleagues, you know, over a drink after work or something, do they ever talk about the origin of life? And his answer to me was, you know, even though a lot of them were secular people, they weren't believers. He said they, they never talked about it because they all knew it was nonsense. They just figured it was proven in some other discipline or something. And, you know, I noticed um, Dr. Tour that Lee Cronin, he even admitted Origin of life was a sham. I think he tried to walk back on that, but I think you're proving that point right now. Yeah, and 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 uh, in in that Harvard debate, I brought up I, I brought up about ten things that people have never solved. They said nobody has done this, nobody's done this, nobody's done this. He didn't con he didn't oppose any one of those. He just talked about assembly theory, which is a which is a, a standard uh, a, a compression algorithm. Uh, and a poor one, according to Hector Zanil, an information scientist. And, and so, so he, he didn't address any of the science that I put up there. Why not? Because it's unaddressable. And he has even said that origin of life is a scam. They asked him, why do you say that? He said, because nobody has, is working on it and nobody believes it can be done. Now, he, yes, he walked that back on Lex Fridman's podcast. He said he was speaking tongue in cheek. He wasn't. That's a year after his, his tweet. Uh, uh, he put that out there. He says, nobody solved it and nobody believes that it can be done. That's the true answer. Nobody solved it. Nobody's believed it can be done. So I've taken uh, on his, his description. Origin of life research is a scam. I've taken it up. I mean, that I, I, can't, I can't claim that as my own. Lee Cronin came up with that. I'm just quoting him. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We'll link to that uh, 
uh, interview you had with that information scientist who isn't a believer, by the way, and he just uh, shows the problems with the information aspect of it. And, you know, that's a topic I enjoy getting into. Uh, to me, his this whole assembly theory and abracadabra, which I think is ironic because that's pretty much what it is. They're attempting to use magic to get around the information problem. But uh, Dr. Tour, he refers to like memory. And, you know, I know from my industry, I work at Micron as a storage engineer and storage itself requires energy and and there's design mechanisms, intelligence, there's information to prevent corruption. Um, just the whole information part of this is is huge, a huge elephant in the room for them. And there's so many elephants in the room. Dr. Truman mentioned about how they'll terminate an experiment when they kind of feel like they're getting what they want. And knowing that if they keep running the experiment, it'll like destroy what they're trying to produce. So it is a scam, a sham, uh, whatever you want to call it. Uh, and, and just real quickly, Dr. Tour, I want people to go watch your debate at Harvard. I loved your opening with Cronin about how the cell, as we learn more and more about it, it's more and more complex. And our learning of, of it is minuscule compared to the complexity we dis will discover. It's just amazing. Again, I want to encourage people to watch your debate. And again, we will link to it because your opening was just fantastic. Well, it was really the only time because I, I had ag agreed to to not say anything unless asked because Lee Lee did everything to try to back out of coming. He was already there in Boston and uh, uh, and he got a three thousand dollar honorarium just for for coming across town to, to this from he was already in a hotel there for another event for another meeting. And so he had to do this, and and uh, I got nothing. Actually, it cost me a lot to put on that event. So it just shows you how how asymmetric this has to be to get these guys to dialogue. And then he addressed none of my questions, and and I told the organizers because they after they saw the Farina debate, they were afraid that it was going to devolve into a shouting match. And I and I agreed. I, I agreed. I said, look, how about I do this just to comfort you, to comfort Lee that it's not going to devolve that way. I won't say anything. I won't say anything after my opening statement. I'll say nothing unless I am asked a question. And so you see, Lee conveniently never asked me a question. He made lots of accusations at the table, but I was not, I could not comment because a question was not asked of me and that's what I agreed to. And I put that upon myself in order to comfort these guys that I wasn't going to run away with this thing. And, uh, and that's what you see there. But none of the panel, none of the table, none of the panel, not Lee, Nobody asked me a scientific question, nor did anyone contest with my scientific uh, uh, assertions. But Lee totally agreed with me because I predicted Lee would not address any of the polymer classes, and he didn't. And I said that that uh, uh, he 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 would just just avoid all the discussion of chemistry, which he did. He avoided the discussion of chemistry. And when I listen to assembly theory, I don't understand it. I don't know. Maybe you do. That's why I had to get Hector Zanil. And Hector Zanil said, the paper is written in a very confused manner, but uh, uh, but Hector does understand. And so it, it's elementary when you actually end up looking at it. There was a friend of mine who was there who's a professor at Harvard in mathematics and biology, and I asked him if he understood assembly theory. His words were, it was vacuous. There was nothing there for him either. And so so I, th I think Lee is actually moving toward joining the Discovery Institute, it seems to me, because he, uh, uh, he's got so much of intelligent design in what he's, he's uh, uh, supporting right now. To me, it seemed like kind of an illusion, elaborate way to do another version of Me Thinks It's a Weasel by Richard Dawkins of how he thinks that this is accumulating information. So it does seem pretty but, but, convoluted theory. But it wasn't to address origin of life anyway. I mean, the question of the 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 discussion at the round table was origin of life. He didn't address anything that had to do with origin of life. There was nothing there. So, so in, indeed, there was it, it was vacuous. Yeah, and I noticed during the debate, he some somewhere in that debate, he brought up about how you were shouting, and I had heard that before I watched the debate, and I didn't see any shouting at all during the whole debate. No. It's yeah, that's all they no, have was, to go on, I guess. Yeah, there was no no ad hominem attack. There was no shouting, but he said I was I was hurting people's ears. I was shouting at him, and he played upon the sympathies of the crowd. Now, Harvard did warn me 
that I would be the only person in that room that believed as I believe. They did warn me, and I knew I, I was going right on into the lion's den so, so that I had no, nobody on my side. I wasn't surprised by this. But what he did is he used that to play upon them as, and get this sympathy from them. And I was like, how can you people believe this? I didn't shout. Now, uh, 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 Peter Kreeft, who who's, uh, um, who's, was the philosopher at the table, uh, he said to me, he says, Jim, this, th- you, you didn't do any ad hominem attack upon them. In fact, they did it upon you. The only thing you did is you quoted them. You used their own words against them. And that's not an ad hominem attack. So Peter Kreeft was, was very fair about it. What was frustrating to me is there was not one scientific question that was posed to me, neither by Lee nor by, by anyone at the table, nor on the panel, not a single scientific question. Why not? I thought that this was to, to, to discuss the origin of life. It was just a bunch of philosophy, and I'm not a philosopher, and uh, I, don't, I don't try to be a philosopher. I'm not a theologian. I'm just a chemist, and I, I just came with chemistry. And, and so uh, I was loaded for chemistry, and I wasn't able to, to, to really uh, say anything beyond my 20 minutes. Wow. Yeah. That, and people will see that when they watch the debate. So at that table, when you had the round table discussion, so you were the only believer at that table? The organizer was a believer, and I believe that Peter Kreeft is a believer. So the organizer, D- David Tom, he uh, he's a believer, and I believe that he's a creationist, but he took no sides. What he told me, he says, I will be the only person in that room who's a mm. creationist. Now, I didn't discuss creation at all. But he said, Jim, you're going to be the only person in that room on, on your side of that barricade. That's it. And, uh, and, and that's okay. I said, I said, you know, bring it on. I didn't even want a panel. I said, I don't need a panel. I don't need anybody on my side. I said, why don't you just have Lee and myself go at each other? But no, they wanted this, this panel. And so, you, you know, I'm an invitee. And so I was invited and, and I just went according to, to, uh, uh, what, what they did, you know, when you're invited, you just got to roll with the punches. You do, you do what they invited you to do. Yeah. So boy, and I, I see this happen a lot with debates when, you know, especially in origin of life. Again, we had that two part series with Dr. Truman. They just, they have nothing to go on and you're just reinforcing this. And I'm so glad you came on the show to do this. Um, I'm thinking back to your opening again, that you talked about, you know, how we are made of, you know, we're made of molecules and not pieces of metal or plastic like a robot. And, you know, that just the complexity of how we are created and your analogy of how complicated the cell gets. It reminds me, you know, my work that we do, if you take a microscope and you look at one of our NAND chips, it gets simpler the farther in you drill, the farther in you look at it. Whereas a cell, it's the opposite. I mean, it just seems to get more and more complex and, they have to come. How do you explain? How does that originate? It's just amazing that this whole thing that it's a sham or a scam. It, it really is. They they have nothing and yet they act like they do. You know, Doctor Tour. There was a recent article about two weeks ago when we were getting ready for your interview, and it was this whole thing about um, they've discovered the origin of life in fatty tissue. I, I don't even know if you saw that article, but. These things pop up on the news and people just think it's true uh, because, you know, they don't hear enough of that's why real science radio exists. And that's why I'm so thankful for your YouTube channel with all the subscribers and views that you have, because not enough people see this stuff. This was a report, Dr. Tour from Newsweek magazine. Scientists discover key stepping stone to the origin of life. And I don't know if you saw that, but they they said that it's uh, they, they found fatty acids that they're long organic molecules and they both attract and repel water. And this is a bunch that's a bunch of garbage. Of course I saw it. Anytime (laughs) anything like that comes out in the lay press, people send it to me. So I see everything. And, and I, I don't, I don't put much stock in those articles. I go right back to the, the actual publication. That publication was t- talking about a Fisher trope like reaction, which has been hypothesized for a long time to take place in these vents. A long time. 
And so you can get a fatty acid. So what? And all those fatty acids are, uh, have, have no control of the stereochemistry, so they wouldn't be useful anyway. All fatty acids that we see in biology control the stereochemistry. These had no stereochemical control. And plus, they would be in such dilute form, they're not usable. They come spewing out of there. They're so dilute, they're not usable. And there's many other compounds that come out of there that render this unusable because you need more constrained chemistry. You have to have pure things in order to do chemistry. That's not the case with biology. Biology has a way of purifying things by using its enzymes, but chemistry does not. And so, so, uh, um, if you can't crystallize, which none of those fatty acids can be crystallized uh, uh, and separated, you're, you're, you're just out of luck there. So it was a bunch of nonsense. And I don't even see what was novel in that. The Fischer-Trope reaction to make these, these long-chain fatty acids has been known for 25 years. Uh, so so it was, it was uh, a mountain of nonsense. So it, it did nothing for me. Well, yeah. Th- yeah. Thanks for your uh, review of that. I'm glad that you saw that paper. Um, so you had those five challenges, those five questions. Uh, we'll try to link to those from the show. So you said that nobody has come forward at all as far as any kind of technical analysis. It's been mostly philosophy. No, right. And, and I, it was not a challenge that was thrown out to the masses of people. This is what my frustration was at that debate with Farina. You're dealing, I was dealing with a person that does not understand chemistry. He truly does not understand. So when I would present him with a problem, he didn't understand it. So lots of people contact, oh, I have a solution to number whatever. And then as soon as I start hearing their solution, I mean, I I just got to give up because there's so much basic chemistry they don't know. I mean, one lady insisting, uh, I proved it by my, but by my insulin pump. And, and I'm like, lady, I, I don't know what you're talking about. And she was utterly convinced. That's why the challenge, I said, I'm not going to challenge people anymore who are not chemists, who are not advanced chemists. I would not challenge because then I end up having to go back. I did a 14 part series to explain the basics of the chemistry so that I don't have to do this. And none of those people listen to the 14 part series. They, they just start shooting from the hip. And so I put the challenge to the experts, all of these people having published in the area of origin of life. I put it to the experts and none of them could solve the challenge. And all of them were invited to Harvard. And Lee Cronin, once he accepted, then he realized what he got himself into. He tried very hard to back out, very hard. We had to change many of the things to get him to, to agree to this. And it got to the point where the folks at Harvard and the folks at MIT, because this was sponsored, this is a, hard, a, a round table for Harvard and MIT faculty. They were going to write an article about him in the MIT press about how Lee Cronin had backed out after we had spent all this money paying for the venue, paying for the, the, the recording team just like eight days before the event, one week before the event, he said he was going to back out. And so, so we went through a lot of contortions to get him to agree. And it was finally based upon... David Tom saying, okay, we've got a reporter here. We're writing an article about, and it's going to be in the MIT press uh, about how you backed out of this event. And that's not going to look very good for origin of life. And so then he agreed. He says, okay, well, if you live stream it, then I'll come. It's like live stream. I offered it to you. Yeah. <laughs> I, he, he didn't, he don't, he didn't want it filmed. I said, no, it's going to be filmed. But he said, and then and I said, I had offered it in a live stream previously, but he said, if you live stream it, then I'll come. I said, okay, we'll live stream it. And whatever whatever is in that live stream is what will be posted on the internet. And that's what was posted right there. The, the, the crude live stream where there was just a producer in the back choosing the different cameras. That's why it's not perfect. It was just the live stream right there. And, uh, uh, and, and so Lee finally agreed to come because they were going to expose that he, he, he had backed out of this. So essentially nobody wanted to come. Lee agreed to this and then backed out and then had to re-agree to come. But n- none of them want to do this. Look, in my field, in the chemistry field, if you get an invitation to Harvard, you speak. If you get an invitation to MIT, you go and speak. There's only a few schools like that in the country where you will always accept. None of them accepted. Why is that? Why is wow. that? 
a, a, a YouTuber says he defeated me in, in a debate. You'd think certainly the professors could, could uh, do the same. But, but he, here's what it was like. These professors fed Farina with a bunch of data. I liken it to this. It's like when you take an eight-year-old and you put a grenade in their hand and you say, go up to those special forces and let this button loose. That's what they did with Farina. They sent him in there and he had absolutely nothing. But I don't think he even realizes it. They were glad to send him in. They didn't want to come in. And then when they were offered to come in, they wouldn't do it in the top venue in the world to go in to do this at Harvard to a select group of professors from Harvard and MIT. And actually, David Tom had tried to get, when, when, when uh, Lee had backed out, David Tom had gone to uh, Harvard and MIT professors in chemistry and biology at Harvard and MIT. Nobody would agree to debate me. I mean, they live there. They only had to <laughs> come from their building to, to the faculty club and do this. Amazing. Nobody would do this. Yeah, wow. nobody would That's do this. I, n- nobody's going to debate me again if the, if they're if they're an experienced chemist. I'm not debating YouTubers again because they don't understand the chemistry. But to PhD chemists, anybody, anybody, anytime, we will do it. We will do it. And and uh, uh, bring your information. I'm glad to do it. If you have a PhD in chemistry and uh, uh, and you worked in the area to that you understand synthesis, we'll do this thing so that you understand how molecules come together. If you're a synthetic chemist and you think you can, you can uh, do this, I'll do it. And this is what I tried to do. This is what I tried to offer. None of them would come forward because in many ways they were a lot smarter than Dave Farina. They didn't want to be utterly humiliated. Yeah, it'd be embarrassing to go forward. You're, you're kind of putting an arrow on yourself that I'm not really competent. If, the, if you actually try to argue for the origin of life from a chemistry position, you're exposing your incompetence. It's like You're to me, it's kind, of, it's kind of like uh, you know when you get you get, have some historians that say that Jesus wasn't a real person. Yet most historians, like virtually all of them, know that he was a real living person. And so the historian that says he's not real, he's making himself out to be a fool among all his colleagues. And a lot of these colleagues are not believers. You know, it's so it's same thing with chemistry. That's when I asked Dr. Truman, was there anybody that he knows in his field that believes in the origin of life? And he said, no, he doesn't know a single person. And he went to, he got his PhD, I rec- I, if I believe, from Michigan State. And he's worked in the field for years as a professional chemist. And he said that yeah. nobody believes in the origin of life from a naturalistic point of view. And these are people, a lot of them are atheists. They just figure, well, it must be proven somehow somewhere else because it's embarrassing to their own field if they were to try to defend it. And you've just proven this. That's interesting that Cronin was uh, had to be kind of coerced by, hey, you know, we're going to report this. It was good that the MIT news was going to, uh, pro- you know, post an article about that and, to, and compel yeah. him to go. And by the way, Dr. Tour, that being a live event, live streamed, and that's what people see, it was really, you did a great job, you know, for for something that's live that's really not edited. It's It's just really good. Definitely yeah, no. encourage people let, to go let, watch that. Let me let me back up. You said that nobody really believes. No, there's many people believe that there's a naturalistic explanation to the origin of life. Many people believe that. Nobody knows how it's really been done. What you are correct on is that many people think it must be known in another field because most scientists yeah. don't ponder this. Most scientists are not thinking about this. They're busy with other things. Most chemists are not thinking about this. But when they see a talk on it, then it's like, this doesn't make any sense to me. But when you say that nobody believes it, no, they, they all believe it, but they yeah, all have correct, no course. explanation when you pin them down. Yeah, good. Thank you for that correction. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Okay, perfect. So we're getting a little short on time, Dr. Tour. Where do you see Origin of Life going? Do you see any? Uh, no, no. I mean, I'm, 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 I'm trying to pull together, I'm working with some other people, we'll pull together a, a couple of, of articles on this to try to expose some of the problems. But it, it, it's, it's just like beating a dead horse because everything that we're going to write is just a rehash of what people have already written. I'm not the first to see these problems. It's not like Jim Tour is the first to see this, not at all. I'm, I might have the, the, you know, the, the biggest pulpit on this, you know, through a YouTube channel to hit the masses. And people say, well, why haven't you written all these articles? Because they said the articles are already out there. 
Uh, uh, Kern Smith wrote a whole book on this. Shapiro wrote a whole book on this. And then there's lots of articles about this. And nobody has, it pays attention to these articles. They keep publishing this nonsense. So my desire was to go to the masses, to go to YouTube, to go to the people that don't read the chemical literature, because not just because they don't want to, but because they cannot. I can't, I can't read the literature in your field and really understand it. Even within the, the realms of science, once you, you get out of your lane of the science, it's really hard to understand. So to the layperson, to open up a, a journal article and read it and see what's fluff and what's real is very hard. So that's why I took it to the masses, tried to explain it to people in these terms. And, and my whole desire was to go to the masses, but I'm writing some articles now. And as far as on the, on the social media part of of uh, origin of life. I'm not exactly sure where to go. None of these guys will engage me anymore. They won't even write to me an email anymore because they'll know that, that I'll quote them. <laughs> and they, they don't yeah. want this be because it's really, really hard. So it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a very hard thing. You, you know, I'm, I'm kind of left alone out here. N nobody's, uh, you know, I'm person on grata here. This concludes part one of our interview with Dr. James Tour. We will continue this interview on next week's show where we will get into Dr. Tour's latest research, which includes promising new treatments for cancer and also research he's done on the wonder material graphene that Doug and I talked about on a show last year. So for Dr. James Tour and my co-host Doug McBurney, I'm Fred Williams of Real Science Radio. May God bless you.